Hello everyone and welcome back to the Benchformers podcast. As usual, I'm joined by my co-host Josh Sykes. Thanks for having me again, Gab. Uh, and yesterday we've got another guest on. We've got um, Harusal Examiner reporter as well as Uta Beer podcast uh, host, Stephen Chicken. Hey, how's it going? Uh, I'm good, thank you. Are you? Yeah, very well, thank you. Glad to have the season out of the way after uh, after the year we've had. It's uh, nice to, to yeah, have a been, few days to reflect on things. A bit of a turbulent season for Huddersfield, to say the least. But um, today we're doing a bit of a different episode because we're going to be mainly focusing just on Huddersfield Town. Uh, of course, Josh is a Huddersfield fan. Uh, Stephen reports to them. So we're going to be mainly focusing on them and how their season's gone, how they can go forward from here. And just looking back at how they've fallen to this position since the Premier League days. Uh, but yeah, we're starting off then with sort of how... Uh, it's gone between David Wagner and Dean Hoyle all those years ago. Josh, obviously you were supporting them back then. Uh, what was your opinion on yeah. David when, uh, not David Wagner, sorry, sort of when they went up to the Premier League, how did you feel it was actually going to go, obviously, because you were definitely relegation favourites? Yeah, I mean, the first season, obviously, it was kind of just stay up at all costs. Uh, I'm not sure what Stephen thought, but obviously I thought it would just kind of stay up at all costs, try not to be humiliated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Obviously, we Obviously, we did we did well. I'm not gonna lie; it was a it was a brilliant, completely unexpected season. Mm. And then it was just a shame it couldn't carry over into the second season. With obviously, I've got a feeling it could have stemmed from Dean Hoyle's uh, pancreatic illness. I'm not sure what you think, Stephen. I think there are lots of different things. Um, I think David Wagner sort of ran out of steam, and that there's kind of a popular view that 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 game against Spurs where where they lost 2-0 um at, at I think it was at, it must have been at White Hart Lane was it uh in 2018 and there's there's a feeling generally that 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 game David Wagner's attitude to it was we would have lost that game no matter what we'd done and suddenly town became quite defensive and, and I think you look at the results since then I mean everyone always looks at the 2018-19 season as you know the the awful year but it actually yeah. started quite a while before then they had back-to-back wins against West Brom uh, sorry against Bournemouth and West Brom but then they had that that Spurs game they only won one more game to the end of the season and they did just enough to get mm-hmm. over the line and then sort of continued that poor form I think it was seven points in 10 games the last 10 games into the the following season unfortunately yeah I th- yeah I think they definitely had distractions off the pitch as well in terms of like Josh said with uh, Dean, Hoyle, uh, Dean Hoyle's illness, he didn't really help with the attitude towards the game. Uh, players were distracted, even Wagner himself visiting Hoyle in hospital, he was definitely distracted as well. So it, it makes sense that he wasn't entirely there if that if that works. I I think so, yeah. I mean, he was obviously, he stepped away from the club. But, you know, he he's the chairman and there's other people at that club who, who do a job as well. And, you know, obviously Julian Winter was still there as chief exec and David Wagner was... Had uh, had fingers in all kinds of pies as well. They had they still had the head of recruitment, Josh Marsh, still still working away. So they did. No left Rebbe as well was the the head of football operations at the time. So I think you can kind of overplay um, how much Dean Hoyle's absence, how much impact that had on the club. I think that it was clear that there were problems on the pitch, um, mm. but there were also problems off the pitch as well. And, you know, I think it's it's pretty well universally acknowledged that, that the club got their transfer business wrong going into the 18-19 season. Um, yeah, definitely. They, 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 yeah, 100%. Yeah, they, they, signed, they signed wingers that then they didn't play because um, David Wagner had in his head he was going to play sort of a 4-2-3-1 and then changed his mind pretty much. I think it was midway through the first game he changed his mind and, and started playing wing-backs. And yeah, they, they, they never looked like scoring many goals and... and struggled badly throughout the season as a result because there were plenty of games where they actually played okay in the sort of the, yeah. fir- the first half of that season um, but they just couldn't score which sounds quite familiar <laughs> yeah um, yeah e- even now <laughs> yeah exactly I think uh, yeah. back then there was certainly a feel of overspending like um, Josh you were telling me the other day about Alex Pritchard how much money he's actually on at the club right now uh, when he couldn't get in yeah. over Emil Smith Rowe right obviously at the club currently so you look at that amount of money, it's obviously going to leave a bit of financial dent, so they might be a bit worried to to overspend, necessarily. Yeah, I think it was also, because obviously, in the, like you were saying, Stephen, with the uh, the transfers of all the wingers, I think I think we brought in something like four or five wingers. Mm. I think, I'm not sure if it was true, but about that potential deal we had with uh, Adama Traore, which then got pushed aside and then ended up going to Wolves as well. Would have been a decent um, thing. 
Yeah, that was before my time, so I couldn't really speak on that. But I know that, like, even going into this season, they had like six or seven wingers because they had like Adama Diakabi, Isaac and Ben, Zerajee Van Lepara, mm. um, Josh Garoma, and, and there are a few more as well. So they, yeah, yeah. they, they said, yeah. And now that now they've basically got got <laughs> they've got like Josh Garoma. Uh, and then in Benz and Dear Carby, if you want to count them, and and Colin Grant is probably yeah. off. So, yeah, yeah, they've suddenly gone from having all the wingers to, to having none, pretty much. Yeah. Well, I think we can obviously move away a little bit from the the first into the second season, the Premier League, and kind of focus on the back end of that second season and the first season, and obviously back in the Championship. Starting off with the appointment of Jan Sievert mm. back in, uh, I think it was it January yeah. of uh, last year. So, obviously, Wagner came from Dortmund's second team as well. So, you've got Daniel Farker after that went to Norwich, also from Dortmund's second team. And then Sievert going from Dortmund's second again to Huddersfield. Do you think it was about trying to use that same philosophy because it had worked before for Huddersfield and obviously it had worked for Norwich as well? And then going into the back end of that season, it kind of tailed off. We won that one game against uh, Wolves yeah. with him in it. Do, do you think... He could have been a good appointment had we'd have kept him on in the championship, or do you think it had just just carried on going downhill? I think they had to change it at the start of this season, and and I really liked Jan, and you know I was one of the people who was calling for for him to be given a bit of time, but yeah. I think that that Lincoln game, the the cup game at the start of the season, was was sort of. The, the final nail in the coffin for him because we actually did a fan survey and people were said that they were willing to give him a chance but I think when they came out on the first day of this season and, and lost to Derby I think people immediately kind of made up their minds um, and once you've got the crowd against you like that no matter how you know you could be the best manager in the world um, but if the fans have turned against you then then you're really really going to struggle so I think it was the right decision that he went I think it was a a gamble worth taking um yeah. but i think we we said sort of at the time i think he might have been you know the right man at the wrong time because they needed someone to sort of take things back to basics strip everything back get a team ready for the championship and i don't think Jan Siva was, was that guy i mean he could pop up somewhere else and do really well mm. but um yeah for for what the town needed at that time he was completely the wrong guy yeah, I think when um, Daniel Farker and David Wagner, when they originally came to England, obviously had time to get used to the championship and used to English football. But he got thrown straight in at the deep end in the Premier League and he was always going to struggle, if I'm being honest. I mean, I remember when they, when they appointed him, I was I was shocked because there were so many better managers who were available and obviously took this gamble in, which didn't pay off. But it was just a strange appointment because it was, it was a bit out of nowhere. Nobody really expected him to come in. He was just, it was very much a, another version of David Wagner who he just wasn't as qualified as Wagner if that makes sense no I mean it, it only ever sort of coached youth team football um, which you know it can work everyone's got to got to take a step up at some point I do wonder if in hindsight they might have um, given that they were basically already relegated anyway I know it was January but I mean realistically they were never going to stay up and yeah. his brief wasn't to keep them up it was basically get them ready look ahead to next season Um I do wonder if they could have just gone with a caretaker till the end of the season and then appointed Jan in the summer and whether that might have earned him a bit more time and patience because obviously the the fans had seen him in the, you know, he'd already had, uh, you know, a number of games in the Premier League. I, I can tell you how many, hang on. Um, he'd already had sort of 15 games in the Premier League and, and had only won one of them. Um, so I think there was a certain set of fans that had already kind of made up their minds on him. And I think if Town had had... The exact same results at the start of this season without Jan having managed in the Premier League, then he might have got another half a dozen games or so. But it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, I think um, if you like you said they did appoint a caretaker manager, that could have also had real negative uh, repercussions from that. They could have, it could have been a way of saying that they're surrendering, if that makes sense for uh, yeah, Huddersfield. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, fans that's fans true. might have got a bit unrest at that and then therefore just stopped back in the club. Well, not obviously not supporting them, but not really back the rest of the season, if that makes sense. And the unity may have just disappeared at that point. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's easy to say in hindsight, isn't it? And, and I think it was the right, you know, you can see the logic in them saying, well, let's give him six months to get his feet under the table, see which players he might want and which who he thinks he can and can't work with. So there was a logic to it. But I mean, I don't know what your reaction was it to it was, Josh, as a, as a fan, you know, having an unknown coming in. I, I, I know that there are a lot of people who are very sceptical right from the get-go. Yeah, I mean, I kind of looked at it from the point of view as... I, 
it had worked before for us in David Wagner, but obviously, like Gabriel said, he'd gotten used to, he'd had a season and a half in the Championship, I think it was, and Daniel Farker the same with Norwich. So I think appointing someone like Jan Siever, it, just going straight from Dortmund second into the Premier League, it's it's a massive step up considering that English football is more renowned for being a more physical league than Germany anyway, never mind the Premier League. Um, so I think there was better appointments for me personally who I was more looking forward to getting in and then Jan Sievert came along and I saw him obviously going up in the odds and other fans talking about him, did a bit of research on him. But personally, I'd have, there was better appointments for me that we could have got in. I understand why we brought him in, and I do, because obviously, like you said, to try and maybe look forward to set up for the championship in the Premier League, just kind of surrender in the Premier League and just be, yeah, we're going down, mm. pick it up again next season, just give him some time to build a squad. But in my opinion, he was never going to bring morale into the dressing room and kind of build everyone up purely for the fact that he was inexperienced and you've got the players who on the money they're on are just going to be looking at him thinking you're not as good as what you're of what you could have been yeah why should we respect you if you did such yeah i mean in the premier league against some of the most well some of the most talented managers in the world uh pep guardiola jürgen klopp you, you don't put jan siva in with that sort of caliber of manager and it, it was just a, it was a step too much for him. And I feel like if if Town were going to be should have been a more experienced manager, uh, Chris Hooton. Uh, I don't know who else was available at the time, but I feel like they needed someone who had proven themselves to be able to maybe turn the ship around and get them firing again. Uh, if it was obviously going back to that, who who do you think Stephen could have been an ideal replacement for Wagner? It's hard to say because. As I say, I think whoever it was, it's always hard to be the guy who follows the guy. So it yeah. it, almost, it almost feels like they needed someone to be a bit of a fall guy after David Wagner. Um, yeah. Like, as strange as that is to say, particularly, as I say, the, the situation they were in, they were all but down. I think you could have put practically any manager in the world in that job and they wouldn't have kept town up and, and people would have been fed up with them by the end of the season. I'm sure there are plenty of managers who would have had a, a better go at it than Jan Sievert, don't don't get me wrong, and you know maybe got a few more points on the board and maybe town could have gone down with a bit more pride. But um, yeah, I think... I think fundamentally, bearing in mind that it was you know it was Wagner's decision to step away. He he decided he'd had enough. He was burnt out. He wasn't taking the club forward. It, the timing wasn't wasn't fantastic. E- even if it lasted, and you know even if Wagner had stayed another couple of months, then uh, then the, the new boss would have had you know a, a little bit more credit going into the summer. I think. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Do you think do you think it could have been good to get a more proven manager? And obviously, yes, Huddersfield were going down anyway. But do you reckon it could have been more beneficial to Huddersfield to get a, a more like an Allardyce. well-known manager? In, yeah, like a, like someone like Sam Allardyce mm-hmm. in, who obviously fans know that he's got a record of keeping teams in the Premier League. Obviously, all fans knew that we were never going to stay in. Mm-hmm. But could that potentially have given the players a bit more of a boost towards the end of the season? Left the Premier League with a bit of dignity and kind of carried that through into the championship instead of going five, six, seven, eight games without a win. Potentially in an ideal world, but I think you have to also think about why would a manager of Sam Allardyce's calibre, what would he have to gain from going to, I know he used to play for town, but what would he have had to gain um, from going to Huddersfield Town when they were basically all, all but down already? Unless you were willing to give someone like that the job going into the new championship season as well and bearing, and also they would have been extremely expensive is the other thing but um but unless you were willing to give them the job longer term i think it's it would have been the wrong appointment and we've kind of seen that this season as well i mean the 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 cowley's got sacked not to skip ahead too much but the cowley's got sacked at the end of this season because Part of the part of the reason for that was the perception was that their their football was not exciting enough or progressive enough, and they wanted someone a little bit more who'd get the the blood boiling a uh, bloodstone a little bit. So yeah, uh, yeah, I, I think that was the idea. To be honest, I think that the principles that that under underlie them appointing Carlos Corberan over the last few days, last week or so. It was basically the same thinking that went into to appointing Jan Siever. I'm not saying that it's gonna yeah. I'm not saying it's gonna turn out the same, but I think the philosophy is basically the, the same. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think going, uh, going back to Jan Siva as well then, obviously he left the club with a win ratio of 5.3% with one win uh, and three draws from 19 games. It's not to be awful, it's not a good enough record for a manager, completely not. Uh, but then again, going off back how he got sacked and things like that, do you think at the time the Cowboys was the right move for Huddersfield Town? Or do you think there would have been better going for a manager who knows the championship, for example? No, I think I think the Cowleys were absolutely the right appointment. And bear in mind, they had at the time they had sort of they they looked at the Cowleys as a long term appointment. They thought that they were going to be there for two or three years. Mm-hmm. And and you look at the the CV the Cowleys had. I mean, it was the best CV in the in the league. That that you know that they had promotion after promotion and stepped up from sort of the ninth tier all the way to the third tier. They they'd yeah. done a, an amazing job at Lincoln to get them from non league to they were you know towards the top of League One at the time they were appointed. Um, at Huddersfield Town, they're just beaten Town in the cup. So, you know, of all the CVs that that would have landed on Phil Hodgkinson's desk, um, Danny and Nicky Cowley's was was top of the pile, I'm sure. And that that was the best appointment they they could have made. And you know, it's I, I've been quite. I don't think it's any secret either on Twitter or the podcast or the things I've written that I'm a I'm a big fan of the Cowleys and I think they they're, they're going to be Premier League managers within the next sort of yeah. two or three years. Yeah, I agree with um, that. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that that yeah, that, I don't think there's anyone better they could have got really. I mean the fact. No, so, sorry, go on, Josh. I was about to say, so obviously they were appointed on the 9th of September. Uh, their first game was a two 0 loss to Chef Wednesday, followed by a four two loss to West Brom. And then from there, we went seven games unbeaten, picking up 15 points, starting with a 1-1 draw to Millwall, with their first win coming on the 10th of October against Stoke. First of October, I think. So it's, yeah, so it's, it, oh yeah, yeah it, does, it does say 1st of October. Um, so obviously, it took them a couple of games to get into it. But once they did, then we got seven games unbeaten. Do you think... Had they been in from, let's say, the start of the season, things could have come much differently for town throughout the rest of the season. I think potentially one of the things that everyone sort of pointed towards was was fitness. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, that, that. Well, we put it this way: this is an exclusive for you, actually, because I've not told anyone this before. But I've got no one to nothing to lose by saying it now. <laughs> we were told one of the players that left Huddersfield Town in the summer. We were told. I was told. Um, that that his new club were not impressed with their level of fitness, and oh. that sort of, that sort of raised concerns about whether Town had got their fitness work right um, yeah. going going into the new season. So we we heard that whisper sort of towards the beginning of the season. Poss- I think it was just after the season had started. Um, we, yeah. we we got we got word of that. So. We obviously were then on the lookout for that, and it was acknowledged by after Sievert was sacked. Uh, Mark Hudson acknowledged it after uh, I think it was the Cardiff game was his first game in charge. He came out and said, "Look, the players yeah. just aren't fit enough because the, the the number of points they threw away in the last half hour of games at the start of the season was unbelievable." I mean, you mentioned that West Brom game uh, when the Cowleys were in charge that their second game in charge. Town actually played really well in that game, mm. and yeah, they did. And people forget I think they were they were two one up in the 69th minute and ended up losing four two, but they they threw away so many points from winning positions um, or from you know from from drawing positions in late on in games at the start of the season and once you get if you get the, the fitness work wrong in pre-season then it's almost impossible to catch up on that like yeah. you, you you just mm. you you don't have the time to do it on the training ground because you, the players have too many rest days you've got to do tactical work etc etc you know you've obviously got games to play um so if you get it wrong in pre-season it's almost impossible to catch up on it so i think I can't imagine the Cowleys would have would have made that mistake in terms of fitness. To be honest, um, yeah, and I think we're not, we're not quite sure who was responsible for that. But I, the kind of sense I got was was perhaps there were a few people at that club who who underestimated the demands of the championship, and ultimately yeah. it's Jan Sievert who was responsible because he was the head coach at the time. Yeah, yeah, I think the ch- obviously the championship is the most competitive league in the world at the end of the day. I mean, you look at the end of the season; there were. I think there's six games to go, the bottom five teams, not a single one of them went down. So you know the, the sort of level of tempo it needs to be for this game. So fitness is probably the biggest factor when it comes to, uh, well, obviously performances, but fitness is absolutely huge when it comes to it. And, um, yeah, in a 46-game uh, league, yeah. Sorry, Josh, what were you going to say? To uh, with you, I forgot. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> I was going to say something. Um, obviously, I remember the first 
the first few games under Jan Siever watching town, you could tell that the tempo was good up until about the 60th minute, as you said, and then it kind of just dropped off after that. Mm. And obviously, ultimately, it is down to the manager as such to gauge the level. Of, obviously, you've got fitness coaches and things as well in a club, but it, it's down to, obviously, the manager to kind of gauge the level of fitness. So do you think that could be down to the fact that Jan Siever was unexperienced in English football doesn't didn't know the correct level of fitness to get the players to. The, I mean, yeah, I mean it's hard to say without obviously having been there, and as you can tell, looking yeah. at me on the Zoom, you know I'm not an athlete myself, so it's not. But I mean that that would be my best guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, seven sorry. Um. So obviously the Cowleys, we after that seven game unbeaten run, it it kind of became the the up and down season that it was with. At times, we were threatened with relegation. At times, you thought, actually, we could potentially finish somewhere like mid-table. Mm. At the start of the season, obviously, under Jan, before the season started, where was your expectation level of where Huddersfield could fin- could have finished in the Championship? I think it's funny. I was looking at the fan survey from, from this time last year and what the fans said, and I think everyone was sort of on the same page, which was if they'd finished 10th um, yeah. and had sort of, you know, a few exciting games um and some some you know if they'd beaten Leeds maybe at some yeah, point along yeah. the way and and there was a clear sign of progress going into the news into 2020 2021 um yeah. then i think everyone would have been pretty happy with that i don't think anyone was was expecting town to to make it you know to bounce straight back up into the premier league or no, to make the yeah. playoffs straight away that like that just wasn't because you know they they were so poor in the premier league and it was so clear they needed yeah. they needed a rebuild because so many players left as well um so i don't think anyone expected the world but it was <laughs> turned out a lot worse than anyone sort of dead dread really um yeah. you know what one point after after eight games i think it was um and two after nine it's uh, completely unprecedented that, that that a team has done so badly in the start of the season and then stayed up, um, and then yeah. and then funnily enough, we've had two teams do it this year because because Stoke did it as well. Stoke had an even worse start than Town because of yeah, course because of course it was it was Stoke that Town beat <laughs> um, in the 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 tenth game. So yeah, I, I don't think anyone sort of saw this coming. We we I think. When I look look back at the fan survey, I think it was something like four percent of fans expected them to be in a relegation battle again. So yeah, mm. yeah I don't think anyone foresaw quite how how bad it would be. I mean, it puts it into perspe- no. perspective because obviously that West Brom game uh, at the end of the season, if you hadn't have scored that um, late winner, of course, I think town, would the town have gone down? Uh, yeah, but obviously they were playing in flip flops against Millwall. So, because um, <laughs> Wolves Cowboys have been sacked, obviously if they, if they hadn't beat West Brom, I I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I presume they would have kept the Cowboys on, mm. um, yeah, and got rid of them after the Millwall game. It was yeah. apparent that that they had that um, lined up. That 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 I think the plan was to set them either once they were safe or at the end of the season, whichever came first. So, because mm. cause we know that they were talking to Carlos Corbran for at least a month. Um, yeah. And uh, there's been some sort of su- some suggestion that the Cowleys had an inkling during lockdown that, that, that this might be coming. Mm. So, mm. yeah. Yeah, I read online that um, apparently, you... the, sorry, um, tempers have been brewing between the Cowleys and Hodgkinson for apparently months about transfers and tactics on the pitch. Uh, like you said before, they weren't, they weren't playing exciting football. And as a fan, you want to see exciting football. Even if sometimes it doesn't result in promotion, it might result in a 4-0 drilling of a team or something like that. Um, but obviously, if there's problems between the board and the actual manager, then it, it kind of, the fate was sealed for the Cowboys before. Like, if they're talking to Corbran, how, how, I don't pronounce his name, sorry. Um, Corbran, yeah. Corbran, I'd... so far, so long before he sacked. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can't I can't speak about the, the rumours, really, because it's, again, it is rumours and it's, you yeah. know... Yeah. Um, it'd be a bit, you know, as a professional journalist, I can't really get into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, um, but, yeah, I mean, that they did, they did say in the statement that they had a different idea about how the club should operate, as well as the yeah. style of football, which suggests that that you know, things often aren't as dramatic as as the tabloids like to make out. But um, mm. I think it's clear that there were there were probably disagreements, should we say, between. Yeah. Uh, on how certain things should be done, uh, you can only imagine yeah. transfers would be part of that. That said, they had a fantastic January transfer window, and yeah, and, oh, yeah. and and the style of football thing, 
and we've said I've said this before, but I think fans only really care about the style of football when you're not winning. I think when you're winning, people don't mm. don't don't really care. And to mm. be fair, going into lockdown, town were in decent form. Sort of if you, that just before and after Christmas, they had a really difficult period because they had so many injuries and they they kind of caught up to them. And those performances against Stoke and Barnsley at the turn of the new year were about as bad as it got for Huddersfield Town this season. Yeah. But them in the, the the Bristol City game away, but mm. then. You know they had some really good performances. That they they beat Hull comfortably. They beat QPR comfortably. They beat Bristol City was probably their best performance of the season. They beat them two one when it could have been five one, and then they beat Charlton Athletic four um, nil. Yeah. And yeah, they lost to Leeds going into lockdown. But I mean, Leeds were absolutely on one that day. That anyone yeah, would have yeah. lo- anyone would have lost to Leeds on that in that game. So there's no real shame in that. I know that fans, you know, obviously it's Leeds, and so no one's going to be happy, but. To, to hear that but I think that's the truth of it and so it looked like things were starting to come together and then you come back from lockdown and go straight into that Wigan game and they, they lose 2-0 and you know were, were pretty dreadful really they had something like 70% possession and, and never looked like scoring um, yeah. and that sort of that trend sort of continued throughout a lot of the rest of their games there were a lot of nil nils uh, you know, against the the one against Preston was was intentionally sort of played for a nil nil, but mm. against Reading and Sheffield Wednesday they were clearly trying to score and just couldn't couldn't find a goal. They lost two nil to the Luton. Yeah. That Luton game was was pretty rancid as well. Yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, just it feels like it felt like they had momentum on their side going into lockdown and then coming back and playing behind closed doors. It just absolutely killed him yeah Mm. obviously if we can go back to January obviously you were saying that Huddersfield had an amazing January transfer window and they did it was arguably the best transfer window since the first in the Premier League Mm. obviously with the likes of Emil Smith-Rowe coming in um, Harry Toffolo Harry Toffolo uh, Jonas Lozo coming back to the club uh, Danny Simpson as well coming in to fill the right back spot which had been problematic throughout the first half of the season. Yeah. What are your what are your takes on the transfers obviously took place under the Cowleys in January? Yeah, I mean Simpson came in a bit earlier. He came in in, in sort of September as a free agent. Yeah. Um but but and helped shut it up. But I know what you mean. He was he was the Cowleys yeah. first signing. Um mm-hmm. and yeah, I mean Richard Stearman was was fantastic as well. Um at centre back I thought he he his town got bullied so much by a lot of teams and yeah. town still had a lot of problems um after Richard Stearman came in and I think their sort of defensive mm. record um in some games shows that but he also sort of he helped stop them get bullied quite so much um because yeah. Jon Goran Stankovic was absolutely brilliant in certain games and there are yeah. and there are other games where he and Schindler they just the pair of them just look too soft I think um yeah so, but yeah, I mean, you mentioned Smithrow. I mean, he 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 made a massive difference in attack um, yeah, in certain games. Chris Willock as well was a bit more inconsistent, but there were certain games as well yeah. where Chris Willock had a real influence on things. And yeah, the, the way I'd I'd kind of describe it after those January signings is is that the the ceiling kept getting higher and higher on on what was possible for their performances but i think the floor mm. the floor also didn't really move because you you still had you know the the, the 3-0 um at home to cardiff was was pretty bad and the the 3-1 yeah. away to swansea as well had everyone absolutely throffing so um yeah. yeah i think i think that was a better side on their at their best than than anything mm. else you had sort of um at town this season but they were also capable of of getting, of putting in some some shockers. Still, yeah. So, I yeah. think with with Town that transfer window may have potentially saved their season as well because you were lacking an attacking midfielder. Uh, was oh yeah, P- Pritchard was he injured for? Yeah, he was. He, he missed nearly all the season. He had like a cyst behind his knee, um, which uh, which was causing him a lot of pain. So he yeah. he he was barely. I think he played like two games for the Cowleys um, mm. between them coming in and. Um, and February, I think it was. I think he played two games. So, um, and and they, I mean, straight after the first game of the season against Sheffield Wednesday, Danny Gowley said he wanted to play four two three one, um, and that he couldn't because he didn't have Alex Pritchard available. I think it was yeah. Birmingham and Swansea. He was able to play four two three one, and other than that, they weren't able to play it at all until they got Emil Smith Rowe um, mm. before the Brentford game. So. 
yeah, that that they were sort of living hand to mouth in terms of tactics and results and and who was available because don't forget they had the injury crisis in December as well where yeah. I think like yeah. I think Danny Simpson got injured uh, Tommy Elphick obviously was ruled out for the season in in November as well uh, Jaden Brown got injured Terence Kingolo got injured you also had Kingolo was dropped from the squad because of yeah. underperformance as was Isaac Benza and Adama Diakabi so that didn't come at an ideal time when you got the injury crisis so you know you look at some of the lineups. There was one game where they played Janinio Bakuna at right back and Lewis O'Brien at left back because because yeah. they had so many injuries. Um, and you know the the win away to Charlton in mid December. Um, Matty Daly is scoring the winner, teenager. So they had real difficulties. And Cowley said after the, they drew against Wigan that he felt like he was managing with his hands tied behind his back. But they still managed. Yeah. Despite all of that, they still managed to beat Nottingham Forest just before Christmas and they beat Blackburn just after Christmas as well. So th- those results kind of kept them going and kept them um, kept them sort of their heads above water because I think, and I think they deserve, I think it's kind of got forgotten now because everything that, that went on, uh, that went on during lockdown, but the way that they, they kept getting points in December, despite everything, um, yeah, was was as important as any other stage this season. I think it's part of the reason it got so quickly forgotten as well is because, as I say, they came back after New Year and then they they lost three in a row. They lost to Stoke and then yeah, then in the cup to Southampton. And then they lost to to Barnsley and the, the performances against Stoke and Barnsley were terrible. So, um, but yeah, I mean th- those. December performances and those three wins they got in December were obviously as big as any other wins they got this season. Mm. Yeah. So I'll say fast forward then now to the 2 1 win over West Brom on the 17th of July. Mm. Danny Cowley sacked that weekend. Um, what was your take on the sacking? It was a surprise, obviously. Um, I don't think anyone. We'd sort of heard, heard rumours and kind of dismissed them because it didn't seem to make a lot of sense to be honest yeah. Yeah. Um, and the club actually you know shot those rumours down um, but obviously they they couldn't exactly tell us if they were going to sack their manager yeah. so yeah. so you can understand that um, and as I say it was but as I say it was clear that the Corbrand's name basically came into the frame very very quickly and mm-hmm. and the the uh the statement about Danny Cowley's sacking also said that that they weren't accepting applications. So it was obvious. Yeah. It was obvious from minute one that they knew who they were going to replace him with, and that they basically had it done and dusted. It was just a case of sort of agreeing the compensation with Leeds and and yeah. doing all the paperwork. But I mean, we had Corbrand's name pretty much straight away uh, after Cowley yeah. was sacked. I, I felt. I mean, I felt I've kind of mellowed on this a little bit now, particularly knowing who they've got to replace him and th- that that's all been wrapped up so quickly but um I I'll be honest I thought it was the wrong decision um and I told the club so um what, the wrong decision to sack the Cowleys yeah yeah oh, I uh, went to a point uh, no Corbin. no sorry sorry no not 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 a point in Corbrand sorry Corbrand's a separate issue but I'm talking about yeah. Yeah, the Cowley. Sunday the Sunday when Danny yeah. Cowley was sacked um you know the club the club phoned me to tell me and as I say I I, I told them I, I uh, I thought it was the wrong decision, but um, I've kind of, I st- I still think it's a, a massive gamble. Put it that way, yeah, even if yeah. you know, even if Corbrand turns out to be a massive success, it doesn't necessarily mean it was the right decision to sack the Cowleys in a way because yeah. Yeah. that they were almost a surefire, uh, as close to a guarantee as you're going to get of of yeah. at least having a solid season next year, even if it was unspectacular. Mm. And I, th- I think that uh, in the, the the position that not just Town are in, but every club is in in the Championship, no one's got any money to spend. And I think the teams that are able to be pragmatic are going to do very well. And the Cowleys are, are as good as it gets in the game at that. Uh, and I also don't think that I also think that the criticism about their style of play was a little bit harsh. To be perfectly honest, because yeah, I, agree with that, yeah. I, th- I think a lot of times this season. Um, they've had to be pragmatic because we. I mean, we just talked about the injuries and so on, but mm. they've had to be pragmatic because of the players they've got available. And when they have had the players that they wanted, and they have, you know, they, they've put in some great performances. We've talked about those Bristol and Charlton games. On the other hand, they had three months off, um, you know, under lockdown 
to get that squad ready and they had pretty much everyone everyone fit and available for most of the training camp they came back without Fraser Campbell and Steve Mounier and I think that definitely hurt them in in those first mm. couple of games back against mm. Wigan and Nottingham Forest because <sighs> Carl and Grant and everyone sort of still thinks he's a striker but I'm I don't think he's a lone striker particularly no. I think he can play with someone but he needs a, an Emil Heskey alongside him kind of thing um and he's Brilliant. he's just <laughs> yeah, he's just not he's just not a lone striker. So they were always going to struggle without Campbell or Mounier. But nonetheless, I mean, the performances under lockdown conditions were were generally terrible. Um, yeah, the, yeah. The, the 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 they they beat Birmingham three 0 But let's be honest, when you look at Birmingham's results, <laughs> that was as much to, no. that was as no. much to do with Birmingham as it was Huddersfield Town. All three goals yeah. came from all three goals were sort of from dead balls as well. They were either free yeah. kicks or, or or penalties. And um, the West Brom game is probably, and Preston, to be fair, where they had the game plan and they played out a good draw. The the Preston and West Brom games were probably the only ones where you'd say those were good performances. I mean, they were fantastic yeah. against West Brom. Don't yeah. get me wrong. Like, that West Brom performance in context and when you're talking about, yeah, it wasn't the most exciting football to watch. But again, as we talked about, People don't care if you're winning, and you can't tell me that mm. anyone anyone was more excited at any point in the season than they were when Emil Smith Rowe scored that winner. And it was a brilliant game yeah. plan. It was a completely unexpected game plan. We we sort of wrinkled our noses at the the team sheet when it came out because like mm. there was no Carline Grant, no Emil Smith Rowe, and it was like, what are they doing here? But they played a four a four four two more or less um, that then became a four three three in possession, um, and the the players executed it absolutely perfectly, and and they deserved that win. So, so yeah, definitely. I think I think it was also just that was part of the sort of the shock at, at the Cowleys getting sacked. If if they had gone down or if they even if they'd lost that game, um then you could kind of understand it because it, when you go down the manager is always likely to be in the firing line. But it was the fact yeah. that it that it came less than forty eight hours after they'd just secured their safety by beating the second best team in the in the division who are now going to be playing yeah. Premier League football next season. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, but as I say, it it's it's hard to judge the decision at the moment because we've kind of only got sort of three quarters of the story. Um and it could mm. be that Corbran is is the second coming of David Wagner and no one's talking about the Cowleys this time next year. So no. yeah. It was a gutsy decision, whichever way you look at it though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think with the Cow oh. we do keep doing this. <laughs> I think with the Cowleys as oh, well. No. Um they haven't actually had like a full season getting there. Like they haven't had a summer transfer yeah, window. Exactly. Where they, obviously they brought in Harry uh, Harry Toffolo from Lincoln, who they've worked with previously. But other than that, they haven't got their own players in. Um, they've had people who they've had to uh, let go out on loan. For example, uh, Terence Congolo when he was in bad form. I think if it, I as um well, I'm not a football chairman clearly. Um, but if I was a football chairman, if I was Hodgkinson, I think it would have been smart to keep Cowley on further, let him have a summer to build his squad. If it doesn't work with his tactics and his players, then then maybe look for other routes to go. But. It just depends on who you could have brought in, really. Yeah, and they've obviously got faith that, that as I say, that Corbrand's going to bring them something that that they felt they didn't have. And, you know, I, I think the biggest criticism of town under lockdown was they, they couldn't attack. They didn't know how to get the ball in the net from open play. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, I think that the West Brom game was the only time they managed it um, under lockdown conditions. Um, although, no, hang on, they, they got on against... Uh, Millwall as well on the final day, didn't they? But yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was everyone's forgotten about that game already. <laughs> I was there and I've forgotten about that game. <laughs> so yeah, sorry. We, we what's your take on Carlos Corbrand's appointment then? Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, very ambitious. I know that that he's very 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 well thought of. Um, Leeds would genuinely looking at him as being the successor to to Marcelo Bielsa and I know that their yeah, fans yeah. are pretty gutted to have lost him um so it's a big coup uh, in on that regard and you know as as I said earlier he's it's not a Jan Sievert situation at all this it, it just isn't because yeah. you know Corbran has been managing first team uh I know that 
everyone you know everyone knows he's been the Leeds under 23 manager for the last three years but he's also been involved in the first team for the last two years mm. he's been a first team coach I think nine of his he's been a coach for 11 years I think he's been in, involved in the first team for nine of them so it's not like he's um he's really inexperienced and doesn't know how professional footballers at this level work yeah. he's, he's coming from the champions and I know that we don't like Leeds but he's coming from the team that, that won the league this year um, so he knows what it takes he knows the level in the championship um, which as as we said earlier is one of the criticisms we might have had of, of Jan um, yeah. that, that's not going to be an issue um, but it's a it's a massive rebuild this summer um, Yeah, you could have the you could have the best manager in the world, but if they don't get the recruitment right this summer, then then they're going to struggle because they've already there's twelve players who were who played a part in in this season who have now left the club, and that's yeah. everyone that's everyone down you know from Elias Kachunga to who was one of the the players who played most of the season down to Raquel Pike who played a single minute, but you know yeah. it's it's a lot it's first team players it's um, you know it's. Uh, yeah, who else is on that list? That includes Emil Smith Rowe. It includes yeah, Chris Willock, yeah. Jonas Lurzel, Camille Grabara, um, Danny Simpson's already gone. Colin so, Quan. yeah, Colin Quan has gone. Who was injured for pretty much the whole season? Um, there's a lot of players have have left, um, and there's there's going to be others that get sold as well. You would imagine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they're genuinely looking at bringing in twelve or fifteen players this summer um, yeah. when they are likely to have basically no transfer budget and again they're not unique mm. in that pretty much no championship club is going to have money to spend um yeah. without selling players but it's a massive massive rebuild um so you just hope that that they're able to bring in the players to that that Corbrand can work with and um yeah. and put them in a better position for the new season uh, what's, yeah, so. what's your take on the um on Corbrand actually put as a head coach rather than an actual manager uh what was Josh going to say sorry I was just going to start about new signings, but obviously, like, what do you think about what kind of positions do we need to work on? Which obviously links into what mm. Gab said about him being a head yeah, coach. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say, I think that the two are related. The, the, yeah. the club feel quite strongly that they've got the, the structure in place for um, to get the, the transfer business right. And as I say, there's, they've had a lot of failures and I think they'd hold their hands up to that. Um, but then they would also say, "Well, we got Carlton Grant for two million pounds, and he's, you know, he was yeah. worth fifteen million in January, and they'll be hoping to get something close to that figure again. Uh, whether they will mm. or not remains to be seen because the market's completely changed. But we'll see. Yeah. Uh, they've, they've signed Janino Bakuna, who has been extremely up and down, but I think it's clear that there's yeah. a player there. Um, so you'd think his value would have gone up. Um, they got January absolutely bang on. Um, so." Yeah, they obviously wanted someone to fit into that structure, hence his head coach rather than manager. Um, but uh, but in terms of what they need, I mean, they need probably a goalkeeper because Ryan Schofield uh, is a real talent, but I'm not quite sure whether he's ready at this level yet. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they might want someone a bit more proven, maybe get Ryan out on uh, on loan to League One, perhaps. Um, yeah. They've got, because uh, Ben Hamer, they've still got on the books, but I think the fans are... Yeah. Uh, not convinced on him, so I think they'd have a no. bit, a bit of an uphill battle try to convince the fans to to get behind Hamer. To be perfectly honest, yeah. even though he's had a decent season at Derby, um, they need a right back because Domenico Dehaney is pretty much the only recognised right back they've got at the moment who's actually yeah. played some games and he's played about half a dozen games in his senior career. He was at, wasn't he on, on loan at Boston United as well earlier yeah, in the yeah. season. So it's yeah. a weird one, like National League North to the Championship. Yeah, I mean they they. <sighs> It's not necessarily. I mean, we saw Romani Edmonds Green was in was at that similar sort of level at the start first half of the season, and then he's gone to League Two Swindon, and he's been one of their best players by the yeah, count. Won the league of them. Yeah, and he's uh, you know he's player of the month for them. Uh, he's he's ready for at least League One, potentially even the Championship next season. He's a real talent, yeah. Romani Edmonds Green. So they don't need a centre back as it stands because they've got Stearman, Schindler, Edmonds Green, Elphick will be coming back. Can um, yeah. you can't completely rule out because they've said that no. Corbran will have final say on whether those players come back into the squad. Although mm, I would yeah. suggest Terence Congolo's wages are pretty hefty for a Championship player, so yeah. I would imagine they would like to get rid of him if they if they can. To be honest, um, Harry Toffolo uh, is. Has been fantastic at left backs that, and they've got Jaden Brown as backup who is fine as a as a backup so mm. I think they're fine at left back um central midfield they've obviously they've got Jonathan Hogg Lewis O'Brien Janino Bakuna 
they probably need a couple more because they they obviously they had um, uh, Trevor Chalaber and Andy King on loan, uh, yeah. so they could probably do with one or two more. Um, Alex Pritchard, it's hard to see where he fits in because our understanding it. Well, Lee Bromby's told us that they're going to play four three three. So whether Pritchard's going to go to the wing, perhaps because um, mm. he actually mm. he actually played quite well on the, on the left wing under Jan Siever. So there's potential there. Carl and Grant, you would expect to leave. I think they need a centre forward um, because Campbell and Mounier are both good at certain things, but I think they need someone who's good at a bit of everything. I think they're both. Yeah. I think they're both. I think it's they're both great options to have from the bench, but I think they're both quite specialised in their roles, so they could probably do with a centre yeah. forward. And we've talked about they need wingers, so yeah. Yeah. pretty much pretty much everything except um, <laughs> except central defenders. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, but there's obvious there's obviously some areas that are bigger priorities than others. I think right back, goalkeeper, yeah. wingers, um, and and maybe another central midfielder will probably be the priority. Yeah. Yeah. So, just to kind of round things off from me, I'm not sure about Gabriel, but what based upon obviously the appointment of Carlos Corbran, the team that we've got now, and potentially areas that he could see that we need to improve in and building upon his style, which we're yet to see what that'd be like at Huddersfield. What would you now say, potent without any having any signings or even seeing how he's going to get the team to play? What would you want next season in terms of finishing position? I think it's almost exactly the same now as it was this time last year. I think if they can, yeah. if they can finish sort of mid-table um, with <laughs> exactly the same as we said earlier, a few more exciting games, beat one or two big teams. Obviously, won't be played yeah. Leeds this year. Um, beat one or two big teams though, um, and have sort of signs of progression that that things are getting better throughout the season. I think everyone will be happy with that. I think people, to be honest, with the amount of what people we've had. Um, unless they lose five games on the spin, I think people would mm. even hopefully be a bit patient if they didn't have a, the best start to the season. You know, yeah. if, if they were fifteenth after five games, I think people would would be willing to give it a chance just because yeah. they can't just keep changing <laughs> changing the manager um, and they need yeah. Corbran to work. So I think as long as they're sort of obviously not going to be in a relegation fight, people will give it a bit of time. And if they can get a mid-table mm. finish, I think most people would be all right with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm going to quickly move on to one final thing then. Uh, in terms of, obviously, Christi- Christopher Schindler missed the final game of the season against Millwall and Lewis O'Brien took over the captaincy. Uh, do you see O'Brien as being a possible future captain for the club, say Schindler was to leave? Because I'm sure he, he must be in a decent way, Schindler, having played in the Premier League for them. You would think so, yeah, and being the captain, etc., and one of the more senior players. But um, I'm sure they'd love to keep Chris Schindler if if they can. But I mean, yeah, potentially Lewis O'Brien has got everything it takes to be a fantastic captain. He's, uh, you know, you can see for me, he's been Player of the Year this season. Um, so he leads by example on the pitch, um, and he's a, he's a good lad. He's, you know, I've I've spoken to Lewis a few times this season, um, and he's he's a good lad. He's got his head screwed on. Um, he's very very professional, even though he's only 21. So um, it might be a little bit soon for him yet, but he's got all the traits um, you need to be a successful captain. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, well, uh, Josh, any more questions? No, that's that's it done for me. Uh, right then, that, that's going to bring the end of this week's episode of the Bench Warmers podcast. Uh, as usual, I'd say thank you to my co-host Josh Sykes. Cheers, Gab. It's been a it's been an, uh, an episode I was looking forward to doing. To yeah, the Huddersfield Town one. Um, <laughs> uh, and of course, thank you to our guest Stephen Chicken. You can check out his podcast in the description below. Uh, but yeah, uh, we remember to like, subscribe for more podcast episodes, and we'll see you all next week. Cheers, guys.